Welcome back. Hope you had a good lunch, refreshed a little bit. We're going to go ahead and get started. Dr. Max Lyons, PhD. He has been a teacher. He has been a principal and administrator of elementary, middle, and high school. He has served as a head of school. Well, he said assistant head of school, but an assistant head of school is a head of school because the head of school is gone so much. Uh, he has done that for uh, how many decades? Two, 20 years, I think I saw in your... 20 years at Stonebridge, 35 years altogether. 20 at Stonebridge alone and 35 altogether. He has four children, seven grand... Well, it's not seven now. It's more than seven grandchildren. And, oh, it's seven now. And uh, he has recently returned to uh, the Foundation for American Christian Education, Stonebridge, uh, from his... Uh, previous work with uh, a Christian school, and maybe he'll tell you more about that. But I just wanted to, in case he's too modest to pitch his own writing, he is an author as well. And this is a book we are going to have at American Heritage School in plenty of classrooms, I'm sure. This is Celebrate Our Christian Holidays Like You Were There. We do this here. We try to do this. What's the Christian history of Halloween? Do you know it? There is one. China, well, I'm glad our students know it. A whole book he wrote on that. Sons and Daughters Walking in Truth, A Defense of Biblical Christian Education. Government Takes All, What's Left for Me, The Biblical Case for Limited Government. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Max Lyons from Horace Mann to the Common Core. Good afternoon. Like Carol said, uh, if the hardest part of teaching today is the technology. If that all works, it's good, right? And now, uh, one of the first things that happened to me when I came back to the foundation, became director of teaching services a couple months ago, is they handed me this concept of distance learning and live streaming. <laughs> and uh, you say, oh, it's easy. You have all these programs now, and we have a camera and everything. But when you sit down and actually try to make it all work together and happen, it's not easy. But uh, it's a good thing about education. You're always being challenged. You're always growing. And uh, that's a good thing. Uh, this afternoon, I am going to talk to you about uh, actually two of my favorite subjects. I love history, and I'm obviously an educator, so the history of education. And this is a fascinating history. Um, how many of you feel like you've had a course or a teaching or read a book on the history of education? Ever done that? Most, most people have not. There's just a few in the room. And I distinctively remember the first time I got some teaching in this area and I was amazed because I had no idea about the history of education. So from Horace Mann to the Common Core, I'm actually not going to be, some people you know, thought that I'm going to sp spend a lot of time on the Common Core. I'm actually not. Uh, I want you to understand the story because it is quite a story. And uh, Carol has actually kind of told you the end of the story, which is the good news, the restoration. So I'm going to back up and I'm going to talk about uh, the beginning spe specifically of history of education in, um, in America. And I'm going to skip over, in order to do this, I'm going to have to skip some of my slides because I actually went back to the beginning. And uh, you, you have these in your, your, in your notes because Christian education didn't start with America, of course. It goes all the way back to the beginning. You know, parents have always had to educate their children, right? So Christian education goes all the way back to the beginning. It's always existed. Um, I wish we had a t time to talk about Hebrew education, um, which was parent-centered. And uh, uh, mostly mothers teaching daughters and, and uh, fathers teaching sons. That was, that was one of the basis of Hebrew education. But I wish we had time to talk about that and all the way up through, you know, the early church. Um, church fathers talked about education. They had to 
make a decision of, of having their children trained by, you know, there's always been a choice of pagan education or Christian education. That choice has always existed. They had that choice. So Christian schools were started during the time of the early church and up through the Middle Ages. Uh, the Reformation brought a um, renaissance to Christian education. And most of the reformers, people like uh, Wycliffe and, and uh, uh, Tyndale and, and uh, John Huss, these were, these were all academics. Um, these were some of them uh, university professors, but uh, the Reformation was as much an educational movement as it was a uh, reformation of religion. And uh, Martin Luther, Calvin, uh, started schools, uh, realized that the perpetuation of the faith was dependent upon what, making sure that the next generation understood the truths that they were restoring and bringing back to the common people. So we are going to uh, have to kind of skip through that and come up to and talk about American education because as Americans, we need to know the history of our country and specifically in this area. We kind of need to know what we had, what we lost, and how we lost it, and then how, how we can get back um, the good stuff that God had in store for us. I chose uh, Luke 640. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite scriptures because, um, well, I'll just read it. A student is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he's been fully trained, would be like his teacher. Uh, several key aspects of the scripture that I like. First of all, the fact that, that students, there's a fully training. Education doesn't happen in one year or one week or one month or even five years. It's a process, right? So they have to be fully trained. And we know for some young people that's a longer period of time than others. And to a great extent, we're all still students, right? We're all still, still learning. But the other aspect I like about this is that we will be like our teacher. And that really means um, that each one of us is a composite of all of our previous teachers. All of them put something into our life that makes us who we are. So one, Im one implication of that is that we need to be very careful about whom we choose to partner with in the education of our children because ultimately parents are the first educators and our children will be like us. And some of us go, amen, and, and sometimes you go, oh me. <laughs> sometimes it's a little of each, right? Our children will be like us but they're also gonna be like the teachers that we place them under. So that, that put, puts a great responsibility upon us. I've been in education for 35 years. I started in 1979, teaching in a Christian school, teaching math, actually. I was trained, trained uh, as a mathematician. But now, uh, four children later, four grown children and seven grandchildren, uh, I become increasingly convinced that Christian education is the heart of God and that every child should have a Christian education. You know, right now in our nation, what percentage of children are involved in Christian education? Anybody know? But it's about, it's like less than 10%. It's like 8 to 10%. Okay, but in reality, the 90%, they should have a Christian education as well. Um, that's the way it should be. All right, so let me see if I can do this real quick. Just skip to here. All right. I'm going to skip up to the pilgrims. So right before American history began, or we could say this is the period that American history did begin our forefathers. This is Bradford, and uh, Bradford kept a journal, and we wouldn't really know anything about the pilgrims, what they believed, and who they were, and what their passion was, if it wouldn't have been for the journaling of this man, William Bradford. And so he said this, he detailed the reasons for coming, for their coming to America, and um, he said a number of things. First of all, 
for evangelism's sake. Um, they wanted to build a Christian society and a Christian culture. But uh, one of the reasons that they came was they were very concerned about their children. And this is what Bradford said was going on. But that which was more lamentable and of all sorrows most heavy to be born was that many of their children by these occasions and by the great licentiousness of the youth in this country and the manifold temptations of the place were drawn away by evil examples into extravagant and dangerous courses, getting the reins off their necks and departing from their parents. Some became soldiers, others took far voyages by seas, and others some worse courses, tending to dissoluteness and the danger of their souls, to the great grief of their parents and dishonor of God. So that they saw their posterity would be in danger to degenerate and be corrupted. This is found in your uh, Christian history book on page 192. So what, what did Bradford say the pilgrims were concerned about? Their children, right? Their posterity. These were Christian people. The pilgrims were basically a congregation. You know, and that was one thing that was unique about that, the pilgrim colony instead of the, the Jamestown colony is that the Pilgrim Column came as a, as a congregation, as a church. They saw their children being drawn away, being pulled away by the culture, by the educational system. So that's why the, one of the main reasons why they came for their children. And you're here, every one of us, to, to some extent, because of our posterity, for our, our heart for our children, for the next generation. You know, Americans need to know the history of education. Well, one reason for this is, if I can change your historical perspective, I can change what you believe in the present. Let me give you some examples of that. And, and one reason why we think what we do about education in this country is because we don't know the history of education in our, in our country. Um, I'll give you three examples. If, if you thought that, or were taught that women were dying in droves because abortion was not safe and legal, you could be sold the idea that we should have passed Roe versus Wade in 1973, right? Okay, change your historical perspective, change what you believe in the present. The leader of Germany convinced all the people in his nation that the Jews were traitors, that they were the cause of all the evils in that in their country. He convinced them of that. This enabled him to eventually do what? Practice this, this massive uh, genocide against Jewish people. Here's one more example. Before public schools, children were illiterate. Education was a very, of a very poor quality. If you believe that, then you believe that what they did establishing government schools was correct. But was that really true? So we need to know our history. We need to know our true history. Del Tackett, who um, is a speaker in the Truth Project, the Focus on Family did, said this. I saw this recently, and it really jumped out to me. We remember what we should forget, and we forget what we should remember. Some examples of things that we remember what we should forget, offenses against us. I'm guilty of that one. Somebody offends me, you can hang, along, hang on to that memory for a long time, right? But what do we forget that we should remember? God's goodness to us, God's deliverance. How about the children of Israel? Why did God have to keep telling them to remember and set up systems so that they could remember? Because he kept saying, if you forget, what are you going to do? You're going to go into idolatry. We saw that happen over and over and over again. The scriptures say to remember, one reason I wrote my book on the holidays is because holidays are a great teaching tool. It's a great way for us, ourselves, to remember something good that God did uh, or to remember some important event or some important teaching. But it's a great teaching tool for our children to help them. It's a hook for them to remember. Hey, what's coming up next? Uh, Flag Day. Well, what, what's Flag Day all about? That's June 14th, I think. Um, what's that all about? And then, of course, we have July 4th. These are great teaching opportunities. Children don't know what they mean. They often know that they're going to get out of school in those days. 
<laughs> but beyond that, they need, there's something that they need to remember. My, one of my main sources for this teaching is an, an older book. This book was actually first published in, I believe, in 1984. So it's uh, 30 years old. NEA Trojan Horse in American Education. And it was written by a Jewish man, um, Sam, and Bl Sam Blumenfeld. And he started out, he was going to write a book about the NEA, and he started out, a, a chapter was going to be on the history of education. And uh, when he started digging into it, it really became the whole book. So even though the book, it seems like it's about the NEA, the National Education Association, it's really the history of education. It talks a lot about the NEA as well. Blumenfeld divides American education into three periods, and... The uh, first one he called the colonial or Calvinist. But we refer to this in principal approach education as the American Christian period. From 1607 to roughly 17 or, or uh, 1837. So about 200 years. Then you have the Hegelian or socialist period from 1837 to 1890. And then finally the progressive period from 1890 to the present. Now some uh, add a postmodern period from maybe the 1980s to the, the present. Um, and we could do that. However, there's not a huge amount of difference practically between socialism and progressivism and postmodernism. There's some nuances, but uh, for our purposes, I'm going to divide my talk into these three sections. Now, for you visual learners, I guess I've got to click it to get this going. My colleague, uh, Connie Moody, some of you have heard her. She had uh, made up this great graphic on the history of education in America. And so I thought I would put that up there for you. She's got a lot of, a lot of clicks to make all this come up. So she's got the three periods and, of course, shows the Christian history timeline behind it and you can see graphically what we're talking about. Um, what we're going to do is examine basically the worldview uh, of key individuals in this story of education. So we'll be talking about a lot of people um, and what they believed and how it impacted education. Okay, so... The American Christian period, 200 years. This is the first thing that was like big revelation to me. Wow. You know, I thought Christian education started back in the, you know, the 60s or maybe the late 50s, <laughs> you know, as a reaction to the Supreme Court decision taking God and prayer out of school. Um, but you mean to tell me we had 200 years of Christian education in, in, in this country before we had government education? Yes, we did. Most Americans believe the purpose of life was to glorify God during this period. And the spiritual dimension of life was the most important. So what do you think, what do you, what do you think education was like during this time because of that? First of all, it was mostly private. Uh, not all Christian, but mostly private and mostly biblical in nature. And the purpose of education, the purpose of literacy was to be able to read and study the scriptures, the most important subject of all. And I'll give you a couple of examples. In higher education, Harvard in 1636. Who established Harvard, by the way? Puritans, right? And this is why they established Harvard. They said, after God had carried us safe to New England, and after we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. By the way, it's, you, know, you can see it's got the original spelling in there and wording. This is, uh, a lot of this is from the Red Books, and Rosalie and Ver, for better or for worse, <laughs> uh, it's difficult for us sometimes, preserve that original spelling. Um, 
One of the next things we longed for and, and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to our posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. So, why did they establish Harvard? A, a seminary, right, to train ministers. Okay, they needed ministers. So this is the beginning of education, specifically higher education at this point in, in our country. And here we have Harvard and its purpose. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. In seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let each one seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him, Proverbs 2, 3. Everyone so, show ex so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he should be ready to give such an account of his profi proficiency therein. Seeing the entrance of the word giveth light and it giveth understanding to the simple. Okay? Quite a bit different probably from what's going on at Harvard today. Okay, one thing I want you to notice um, about this is the visual that I, I have up here, and you probably can't see it that well. But this was the original motto adopted in 1692. And if you can see in the, in the middle, it's, it's, uh, it's Latin, it's veritas, which means, of course, truth. But on the side of veritas, uh, you have Christos et Ecclesia. So the original motto was truth for Christ and the church. That was the original motto. That's no longer the motto of Harvard. It changed. And here is the change. Veritas. Truth. Okay? Truth no longer for Christ and the church. Simply truth. This was a very profound change. And we'll see that this happened not only with Harvard and all the other universities established right down at the beginning. Um, most of them were established on, on the Christian faith, but they all, one after another, made the same sort of change. So we got Yale. Yale's charter says to propagate in this wilderness the blessed Reformed Protestant religion. Their motto, Lux et Veritas, Light and Truth. Yale was founded in 1701 in New Haven, Connecticut. And here is part of their uh, founding document. Seeing God is the giver of all wisdom, every scholar besides private or secret prayer, where all we are bound to ask wisdom, shall be present morning and evening at public prayer in the hall at the accustomed hour. Yes. That's a good question, and I, I had that question myself, and I, and I, I couldn't find that answer quickly when I started researching it, so I, I, can't, I can't tell you. Tell it. Do some reason. I tell that to my students all the time. They ask me a question I don't know. That is a good question for you to research. <laughs> okay, so we had Harvard and Yale, then all of a sudden we have um, the precursor of our public schools. Now this is what the the public school people will say, oh, the common schools, the common schools. Okay, well, let's talk about the common schools a little bit because we did have them fairly early on. But first of all, notice that they were locally controlled, they were funded locally by the people that used them, and they had a religious purpose, okay? So to equate that to the modern public school or government school is, is quite a stretch. Um, uh, this was a law actually passed by the Massachusetts legislature in 1647, the Old Deluder Satan Law. You ever heard that one? The Old Deluder Satan Law. Quite a title for a law. Uh, and it was passed to, um, to advocate children being educated. But, but, but listen to why. It being one chief project of that Old Deluder Satan to keep men from knowledge of the scriptures as in former times 
by persuading them from the use of tongues that it, so at least the true sense and original meaning, meaning of the original might be clouded and corrupted with false glosses of deceivers to the end that learning may not be buried in the graves of our forefathers, in church and in commonwealth, the Lord assisting our endeavors. So, you know, I heard one speaker say, if that's what the public school says the basis of their <laughs> system is, wow, let's get back to that. Um, common schools were limited. So several caveats here. They were limited to New England, first of all. And secondly, and more importantly, they were replaced by the more efficient private schools. By the way, private schools are more efficient today than government schools. If you simply do the math and look at the cost of pri a private education and the cost of government education with all the cost in there, um, most private school, and most, and you gotta, you'd have to do it state by state, but I've done it in my state, and the private schools in our state of Virginia are half the cost of the government schools. So they are doing, and you, you probably know this, you look at test scores, and for private school students, they test higher on standardized tests than, than government school students do in general. So there is an efficiency there that still um, was there in that day and is there today. All right, so what were the results of, what were some of the results of, of education during this colonial or Calvinist period? Uh, this is a quote by Rush Dooney, R.J. Rush Dooney. The educa educational accomplishments of America were without equal in the world, as noted in a report in 1800 by a Frenchman, um, I'll, I should let Carol pronounce that, in from the National Education in the United States. That's, that's a survey that was done. The result practically was high, literacy, high literacy rate with illiteracy almost non-existent and only one in a thousand being unable to write legibly and neatly. According to this report, with excellent abilities and the basic skills manifested by virtually all. So they were looking at this, you know, they were all along, they were concerned about how many were being educated and what was the level of their education. John Adams said this, a Native American, and he wasn't talking about an, an Indian, he was talking about a native-born American who cannot read or write is as rare in appearance as a comet or an earthquake. So what about the poor? This is the question that we in private education get all the time. Okay, you're such a big advocate of private education and Christian education. It's great for the families that can afford it. But what about the people that can't? Well, that's been a concern of, of, of parents and uh, policymakers and, and people forever, right? Because we've always had poor. We've always had poor. We've always had middle class. And we've always had um, wealthy. Mary Elaine Swanson said this, but what of poor children whose parents could not afford this kind of education? This is talk, talking about during this colonial period. Seeing the needs, some planners established schools to educate the poor in at least the rudiments of learning. Two such schools, begin by Benjamin Symes and Thomas Eaton in the 1600s, lasted into the 19th century. Free schools were also started throughout the South and in other colonies by the Anglican Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Don't you like the name of that, that society? Free schools. So today, what do we have today? Do we have programs for poor in, in private schools? Yes, we do. Uh, most private schools that I'm familiar with, the school itself has uh, financial aid policy and scholarships available. Every school I've been in, involved with has, ha has had that. Um, there are also churches that have, I, I happen to go to a church that has a Christian education scholarship program. People in our church who want to place their children in Christian schools and can't afford them uh, can submit an application and, and receive monies from this church fund. Uh, there's also school choice programs uh, in various states. We just passed one in the state of Virginia. So we, we now have uh, tax um, credits. Uh, people are giving and getting a tax credit, giving to private scholarship funds, and those monies are going to private schools, mostly Christian schools. So um, this is something that we care about. They cared about it back then, and we care about it today because everyone needs an education. 
These schools were parent-based and they were biblically-based. Parents were assumed to be responsible. The New England Prim Okay, so I'm going to show you uh, a couple examples here of biblically-based curriculum. The first one is the New England Primer, the first textbook printed in this country. And it was first printed in Boston in 1690. And um, I'll just let you read that quote on your own if I can find my book here. Uh, this, is a, this is a reprint. Uh, who did this? Is this Wall Builders? Yeah, Wall Builders has reprinted the New England Primer. But uh, just to give you an example of the biblical nature of the New England Primer, I'll read uh, for teaching the alphabet. They had pictures and a little couplet for each one. So for A, the couplet is, in Adam's fall we send all. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. D, the deluge drowned the earth around. E, Elijah hid by ravens fed. F, the judgment made Felix afraid. Okay, it goes all the way through the alphabet. So that's, and the whole book's like that. So you can see very quickly the biblical nature of this um, textbook that was very influential during this period of time. Which brings, up, brings us up to the father of American Christian education. Now Webster, um, this, is, this is actually a quote from um, Stephen McDowell and Mark Belisles about Webster. He's, they said, while Webster is most known for his dictionary, this is only one of his many phenomenal accomplishments. In 1783, Webster wrote his famous blueback speller, which did more for American education than any other single book except the Bible. His speller, which sold over 100 million copies in a century, was written to instill in the minds of youth the first rudiments of the language and some just ideas of religion, morals, and domestic economy. That's in the words of Webster. So... Um, I actually brought a copy of the Blueback Speller. Again, it's a reprint, and for, somewhat, uh, for some odd reason, the person who reprinted the Blueback Speller, <laughs> maybe that's, <laughs> maybe somebody else's eyes that looks a little blue, but it looks green to me. <laughs> but if you want to come up and take a look at these books afterward, uh, you're welcome to. But... Uh, its premise is that God's word contained in the Bible has furnished all necessary rules to direct our conduct. That's the premise of the book. The book contains many passages of, of scripture, uh, selections, very appropriate. These are all selected for children, obviously. Selections of Proverbs that are very appropriate for children. Fables that have morals, moral lessons. And then some just short lessons like this. No man may put off the law of God. My joy is in his law all the day. Oh may, not, oh, may I not go in the way of sin. Let me not go in the way of ill men. Um, and as there are many admonitions in the Blueback Speller, such as this one. Be a, good, be a good child, mind your book, love your school, and strive to learn. Without frugality, none will be rich, and with it, few will be poor. It has in the back of it a moral catechism, you're familiar with the idea of a catechism, and usually it's, you know, it's religious doctrine that's catechized. But, but uh, Webster wrote a moral catechism. And, uh, for example, here's a couple of questions. What is a moral virtue? And this is something where, you know, the children would memorize. You'd ask the question, and the children should be able to give you back this exact answer. What is a moral virtue? It is an honest, upright conduct in all our dealings with men. What rules have we to guide us in our moral conduct? God's word contained in the Bible has furnished all the necessary rules to guide our conduct. Here's some of the topics, and I won't read them all to you, but it uh, kind of looks like a textbook on character development, right? These are the topics in, the, in this moral catechism. And I was a little bit 
very sensitive to people changing things as they reprint them. And I was really a little upset to see that the, uh, this reprint that someone did, did not, does not have the moral catechism in the back. The only reason I knew that it had a moral catechism is because we have, in the, Rose, in the Slater Hall Library, we have several copies of the Blueback Speller, which Carol pulled one out for me. And uh, I perused it, and I found that moral catechism in the back of it. So I know it's in the original. Um, but sometimes these things also went through lots of printings, and sometimes there was editing. So this could have been a different version. That's a possible explanation. All right, so get, get, getting an idea of the kind of curriculum that they had during this time. And this is what everyone used, okay? These weren't, you know, today, you barely see this kind of curriculum in a curriculum in, in a Christian school, but every student was educated with this type of curriculum. Which brings us to this man, Reverend William Holmes McGuffey. Everybody's heard of the McGuffey readers, right? Um, Again, you know, Webster's Blueback Speller, 100 million copies. McGuffey's Readers, 122 million copies sold over a 75 year, year period. And they're still in print and still used today. Matter of fact, I, I had several sets of them and, and uh, used them with my own children. Uh, Balaz and McDowell said the readers represent the most significant source in the framing of our national moral and tastes other than the Bible. Very, very powerful. Here's a preface to the eclectic fourth reader. From no other source had the author, this is, a, this is McGuffey right, uh, um, saying this, from no other source had the author drawn more copiously in his selection than from the sacred scriptures. For this he certainly apprehends no censure in a Christian country that man is to be pitied who at this day can honestly object to imbuing the minds of youth with the language and spirit of the word of God. So, um, take the time. I'm not going to read all these, but just take, a, take the time to read. These are titles from the fourth reader. Just take a, f a few, you know, 60 seconds to read through those. Are you starting to see what I saw when I first started studying this? The biblical nature of American education for two centuries. Think about that. Two centuries. This was not a short period of time. We're just now coming up on a, the, set, the end of the second century where we've had government education because that was roughly 1832. You know, once we get to 2030, we'll, we'll, we, we still haven't had as many years as, of government education as we had of distinctively biblical Christian education. All right, so what were some of the results of American Christian education? Students taught to reason from biblical principles, study from primary sources, essay and composition were the main methods of testing up until about 1900. That was how you were tested, essay and composition. The notebook method, excellent sources of literature, and the result was many students, not everyone, but there are ex lots of examples of this, students who, who attained what we would consider a university level education. They had that by the time they were 13 or 14. The, things, the tests that they had to take, the things they had to know to be able to get into college, you know, most graduates of college college don't don't uh, be able, don't know those things today. So, um, Rosalie writing in TNL uh, quote quotes this quote: "At the time of the Declaration of Independence, the quality of education had enabled the colonies to achieve a level of literacy from seventy percent to virtually one hundred percent. This education was not restricted to the few." Modern scholarship reports the prevalence of schooling and, and its accessibility to most segments of the population. 
Moses Coit Tyler, historian of American literature, indicates the colonists, quote, familiarity with history, extensive legal learning, lucid exposition of constitutional principles, showing indeed that somehow out of the American wilderness had been carried the very accent of cosmo cosmopolitan thought and speech. And it continues, when the American state papers arrived in Europe, they surprised and astonished the enlightened men. Americans have been dismissed as illiterate backwoodsmen and as perhaps law-defying revolutionists. But when the papers were read and they were found to contain nearly every quality indicative of personal and national greatness. So, um, before we leave this period and go to the next period, we're going to look at the decline and fall of education next. Uh, I want you to, we're going to do the buzz, the buzz thing. I didn't have, I didn't have that name for it, but I, but I like that name. It does sound like a buzz up here. Um, let you stand up and ask this question to yourselves, and then maybe I'll have a few of you share. Okay. Um, comments. A little bit. We have a good long time here. I just, I just, uh, I was thinking, oh, it's time for a break, and I just found out we're not breaking until two o'clock. So <laughs> we'll have to do a couple more of those type of exercises just to, because we're starting to hit the sleepy hour, aren't we? Can you feel it? <laughs> As a teacher, I never appreciated having a class right after lunch. When they scheduled me, I always told the scheduler, not right after lunch <laughs> and not the last period. Have anybody ever taught the last period of the day? Oh, my goodness. They are just ready to go. They got their books and they're just, you know, I'm ready to go, Dr. Lyons. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what are your thoughts? We have somebody with a microphone. Well, it created the greatest, most amazing country with more prosperity and more freedom than any other country has, not only for our country in America, yes. but also for the rest of the world. It influenced yes. the entire world. Yes, absolutely. That's what I want for my children. Yeah. That's what I want for your children. Yes. The real question is how can this be restored? And that's a very positive mm -hmm. question because that insinuates that it can be restored. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a good job in framing the question. <laughs> that's important because when you're a teacher, uh, asking the right question is very, very important. Making correct questions, especially these reason type questions is is, is uh, somewhat of an art. But you know, we haven't even talked about the impact of this philosophy of education and the biblical literacy and the character on the culture. We haven't even talked about it. And you're, you're making a very valid point here. Um, we could talk about its impact on you know, science and economics and you know, our prosperity government and just go on down the line if we had time. We're just kind of narrowly looking at education at this point. speaking in excellent elevated vocabulary, learning very difficult concepts. It seems like our country got on this self-esteem kick where we have to pat our children on the backs all the time even though they're not doing anything. And you know, now I would like to see them doing hard things that they can do and yes. then they know they can do hard yes. things. They've done it and then they know that yes. they don't have to have someone telling them you're a good person, you know, because they know they are. They they yes. know that they've done hard things, and yes. and it's just sad to me to see how that's, yes. you know, I, yeah. Good point. And we what we really need is we need God esteem, not self esteem, because we all naturally love ourselves, right? But we need <laughs> we need to love God, <laughs> and we need to get His perspective on what He thinks of us. That's a very good point. Every, probably every single person in this room, if we asked what we wanted for our children, we would all say that the most important thing that we want for them is salvation. But we don't act like it. And I think we're really afraid 
that if we focus on the, on the gospel aspect, that they won't be prepared. I think it's a true fear. They won't be ready to go. They won't get into BYU or wherever they're going to school. It's a big fear. We don't trust that. If they have this kind of thinking instilled in them, that they will have a desire to learn, and it will, com it will, it will come out of them. Instead of, ha instead of having the desire be the goal, um, or instead of having that, that be the goal, we want the goal to have them love God and, and want to become that kind of a person instead of forcing them to prepare for the future. Excellent point. Yep. Very, very good point. And um, at the end of the year, we were kind of talking about education and, and whatnot. Um, they, many of my seniors were so excited to be uh, graduating from school um, in the sense that they wanted to go to college so that then they could learn what they really wanted to learn, so that then they could expand their minds. They were just doing what was required mm -hmm to get them mm -hmm. to their goal of what they thought then they would be free to learn. And I thought that that was very sad for them that they had spent so many years working so hard, all these AP student kids that just couldn't, just did not, was not able to express mm -hmm. that desire to learn mm -hmm. and express that to their parents. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay, well, one more. Yes. Those that really, those that really, you know, had the right thing, the good things, the rich things to study, and then that's what they focused on. They really let uh -huh. it become part of their life. Yes, good point. Um, as far as I'm not having a lot to, study, you know, textbooks is a fairly new invention. You know, Webster created a lot of his materials because he, he was a teacher for a while and he, he didn't have any materials and he found that quite difficult. But, um, you know, the, the, the sources that they did have were excellent sources and a lot of them were primary sources. So um, with the, the advent of textbooks, what we've done is create something I'm not saying all textbooks are bad. They're not, of course, but some are better than others. But um, some that's caused some to go to totally to a secondary source, uh, you know, curriculum, and they've thrown out the richness of the primary sources. But back then, they, you're right; they were few, but good resources. His mother kept him home and taught him to read from the Book of Mormon. And I never knew anyone who loved the scriptures like he mm -hmm. loved the scriptures. And it was because he first learned them at, he learned how mm -hmm. to read from them. He mm -hmm. first learned them as a young mm -hmm. child at the, at the knee of his mm -hmm. mother. Very good. Very good. Okay. We'll take one more way up there and then and we'll move on. The balcony. The nosebleed area up there. <laughs> Just, I wanted to answer the question, how can this be restored? I think one of the first steps is by our choices. I know that I had a reading session with my little grandson this week, and I had a little book that was for his grade level. He's going into kindergarten, and it was Superman, and I thought this would be appropriate. So we started reading. He was restless and squirrely, and he wasn't that interested, and there was a lot of mindless clutter in this book. And so I picked off my shelf of collection books, and I had my grandfather's Aesop Fables, the first edition, mm. and I started to read to Martin Aesop Fables. And he was absolutely just loving it, and he could see the story, and he could feel the message from them, and I just went, light bulb. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just common sense. We know what's right as parents and as teachers, and 
sometimes we just got to discard some of these accoutrements and these systems that you know are not so good which we'll see as we moved in, into the next period what happened how did we lose this american christian period uh, blumenfeld came up with the title of the hegelian slash socialist period so first thing you have to ask yourself is what does hegelian mean <laughs> Uh, we, we will talk about Hegel, not at, exactly at this point. Um, but this is where public replaced private. I'm going to read a quote to you by James Madison. It's not about education, but the principle here, I think, is, is very important. He says, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. This is a story, a sad story that I'm going to tell you in the next 30 or 40 minutes, is a story of gradual and silent encroachments where parental authority and biblical authority were eventually pretty much removed. So, you know, there wasn't any just one event, there wasn't just any one person, there wasn't just any, you know, government edict or law. Um, it happened gradually. And since we were so biblically based, it's really a testament to how biblically based our, our nation was that it took so long to remove that. Because you think of the 1830s to Supreme Court decisions in the 1960s, long period of time, right? It took a long time for us to officially say, no Bible reading, no scripture. <laughs> um, it did happen gradually, though. And here are some of the movers and shakers. Robert Owen is known as the father of socialism. Have you ever heard that name? A lot of people have never heard of Owen. He, Owen was before Marx. He was a Scottish textile manufacturer. You know, Marx codified some ideas, but these ideas had been around for a long time, and he, you know, he codified them and packaged them in a way differently from others. But uh, that wasn't, Marx wasn't the first one to come up with the idea of socialism. But here's some, some of the things that uh, Owen believed. The problem's not sin, it's the environment. And we're all products of our environment that causes us to do what we, what we do. So a child, he could be trained to be, be either a demon or an angel, depending upon the environmental forces that shape him. Religion is the cause of all problems in the world. Capitalism just based, you know, religious economic system is a great evil. The answer is communism. It will eventually produce a utopia. Someone said once, beware of anybody that promises you, you a, a utopia in the future because they're probably going to create a hell on earth. And outside of the Bible, that's, that's true. That's exact. All these utopians that we've had over the years. And some would say that we... That's where America is right now. Someone wrote a book called Ameritopia, based upon the idea that some are trying to create a utopia here. Anyway, the place to start implementing this new philosophy is with children. Owen believed children should be removed from parents as much as possible to be taught the right way. Um, Francis Wright was somebody who was an, an, an Owenite, uh, sort of. She was lecturing in 1829 and said quite um, uh, plainly what the purpose of education was to be under this, under this new thought system. And she said this, that one measure by which alone childhood may, be, may find sure protection, by which alone youth may be made wise, industrious, moral, and happy, by which alone the citizens of this land may be made, in very deed, free and equal. That measure, you know it, it is national, rational, republican education, free for all at the expense of all, conducted under the guardianship of the state at the expense of the state for the honor, the happiness, the virtue, and the salvation of the state. Quite a statement, right? Uh, made in the early 1800s as we were moving from private parental-based 
church-based education to now the whole idea that not only is it going to be conducted by the state, but what's the purpose of education going to be? No longer glorifying God. Purposes for the state. By the way, Owen established the first communist colony. And it wasn't in Russia or Europe. It was in America. It was in New Harmony, Indiana. And it failed. And Owen concluded that the reason this communist society that they tried to establish failed it was because these were adults involved and these adults had been educated in this Calvinist, this biblical system of education. So he said the only way we can get communism here in, in America is get the children and train them up the right way because this biblical education is not going to allow people to practice communism. So he and his group through their efforts behind the government schools, uh, the establishment of government schools, by the 1820s, you found communist cells in the US. And they were working uh, covertly to establish government schools. This is all documented by Blumenfeld, by the way. So if you want to go deeper, you say, man, you're telling me some things I never heard. Get Blumenfeld. He's NEA Trojan Horse in American Education. He's written several others, too, sequels to that, where he documents this. All right, so then we come up, next we come up to this man. A lot of people know the name Horace Mann. He's considered the father of public education. Rosalie Slater, he removed the spirit, but not the letter of the Bible. He believed that education was the great equalizer, and we'll look at the, in the next slide what, what that means. We hear, we hear a phrase very similar to that today. We hear the, the, the term equality being thrown out all the time quality and how bad inequality is and how we need equality. What does that mean? What's that referring to? Man was using that word um, a long time ago. He made the transition from private to state finance, state directed system of education. This was the man that was used to, to, to bring that in. Rosalie Slater said this about him. He identified a philosophy of democratic socialism education to be provided for all at public expense. The right of every child to expect education at the expense of the state, the common good. Before this time, it was not a right, a civil, education was not considered a civil right. It's a right that a parent, that a child should receive an education, but that right is that the parent would educate them, or a parent would make sure that they had received an education was not considered a civil right during this, during the American Christian period. It was considered a right from the parent. Uh, Mann's uh, state, Massachusetts, that was the first state to require compulsory education in 1852. Compulsory education, the idea laws were passed saying that you had to go to school. You were compelled to go to school. And I have to ask myself, is it the authority of civil government to compel me as a parent to send my child to school between s certain ages or to give them some sort of education. I can, that, to me, that's a parent parental responsibility. Biblically, that's a parental responsibility. It's not a civil responsibility. So that's why we see um, Massachusetts was the first state, and man worked for this. It, if education was going to be a right, then it had to be compelled. Everyone had to go. So this is what uh, Mann said about this idea of the great equalizer. He said, according to, quote, according to European theory, men are divided into classes, some to toil and earn, others to seize and enjoy. Well, I'll stop right there. Where do you get that from? <laughs> European theory? I mean, he's, he's you're talking about class warfare here. Okay, and you can see that, uh, of course, Marx popularized that whole idea. But you, you hear, hear, hear people talking about it today. You hear a lot of politicians talk about the same idea. But he's saying, okay, men are, you know, European theory, men are divided into two, two categories. And this is obviously wrong. According to the Massachusetts theory, okay, this is what I'm coming up with, all are to have an equal chance for learning for earning and equal security and enjoyment of what they earn. 
The latter tends to equality of condition, the former to the grossest inequalities. Try by any Christian standard of morals or even by any of the better sort of heathen standards, can anyone hesitate for a moment in declaring which of the two will produce the greater amount of human welfare and which, therefore, is the more conformable to the divine will? So education was supposedly to eliminate any sort of class warfare, according to man. Now, a friend writing of man said this. I was going to back up and see what happened to this man who was at one time a biblical Christian, one time within the realm of orthodox Christianity, but he moved out of that. Why? This friend writing of man said this, quote, there were certain things that did not feel good to his heart, which he often heard from the pulpit. A crisis took place in man's experience. His whole being rose up against the idea of such a cruel creator. So at some point in his Christian teaching and in church, he began to reject the things that he was hearing uh, about God. And consequently, Christianity was removed. Man joined the Unitarian Church. If you don't know anything about the doctrine of the Unitarian Church, first of all, God is one. That's where, you know, Unitarian, unity, God is one. He's not three persons, so they reject the Trinity. Therefore, they reject Jesus as being part of the Godhead. So Jesus was not divine. He was simply a human being. It, Unitarians reject original sin. They reject predestination. They eventually... Not during this time, but event over time, they rejected the inerrancy of Scripture. So they don't believe in the, in, the, in the Bible anymore. And this is what happened to man. He became a Unitarian. And the Unitarians were strongly behind the public school movement. They took over Harvard, uh, took over the uh, education uh, at the university level, and began to change it from biblical Christianity away from away from biblical Christianity. Rosalie Slater said this, the biblical doctrine of salvation removed as a basis of character and regeneration replaced by a system of moral education and the development of social character. So you'll see this. This is that slippery slope. We see, you know, right in the beginning, it wasn't all bad. It wasn't saying, you know, we need to get rid of God and we hate God and the Bible and, and the things that you see, some of the radical things you see today. It's no, you know, it's still moral, still moral, very moral, still using the Bible for moral purposes. But you start, you start to see a subtle change here and then a not so, not so subtle change. Man began to feel that true religion was the cultivation of social duty and to feed his heart and imagination on the idea of making a heaven of society around him. So just, just look at some of these quotes and just kind of think about it for a minute. Um, this change in man, as you'll see. This is actually man's favorite quote. Love to man is the best test of love to God and must precede it. Okay, in some ways it's a paraphrase of Scripture. But Scripture does say, you know, our dual responsibility of loving God and loving God man but first of all man's definition of god is is changing all right and he begins to uh eliminate the whole idea of love to god and, it, and now it becomes what some have called the social gospel where it's simply the love of man the use of bible in common schools uh at that time Bible still being used in public schools. I know people have said they, they had the Bible used in their education in the 1950s or even later. But how it's used is very, very important, and what kind of authority it is is very important as well. So here are these are a couple of quotes from Mann. Principles of piety and morality common to all sects of Christians should be taught in normal schools, and that a portion of the scriptures should be daily read. See? Read the scriptures still. The practice in common schools is that the scriptures be read without interpretation. 
Now you start to see the slippery slope sliding down a little bit more, right? Are we just going to read the script? We're not, not going to have any commentary on it. We're not going to have any interpretation on it. The holy book is excellent when well understood and rightly used, but an exclusive acquaintance with it is not sufficient to expand the mind and prepare it for the duties of life. Now I think we're getting a little bit more serious with what he's saying about the Bible. Someone said that man removed the Bible from education a hundred years before the Supreme Court did. And I think to a certain extent that's, that's true. You still had the letter <laughs> of the Bible, but now the spirit is being removed. Education is salvation. Schools will be found to be the way God has chosen for the reformation of the world. This is man. This institution is the greatest discovery ever made by man. Talking about his, his common schools. The greatest discovery ever, ever made by man. We repeat it. The common school is the greatest discovery ever made by man. Now you could say that he was trying to be punny there, right? Because this was his invention. <laughs> he said this, we see that there will be a new earth, at least if not a new heaven, when your philosophical and moral doctrines prevail. It has been, my part, has been part of my religion for many years that the earth is not to remain in its present condition forever. You are furnishing the means by which the body of society is to be healed of some of its wounds, heretofore deemed irredeemable. So here we come up with the idea that biblical salvation is being removed, but something is being substituted. Education will become secularized in one sense, and that God and the Bible and the God of the Bible is being removed but education always will have as its base and its nature religion and worldview. It, it a necessity has to. You cannot teach history and science and math and psychology and sociology and um, English. You, you, know, you cannot take. You cannot teach these things. They all have a philosophical, theological, worldview, whatever term you want to put. They all have that as their basis. And that's what's happening here. All right, so some people noticed what was going on. There, there were some people that were sounding the alarms, okay? This wasn't all just happening without any pushback. Uh, one of them was this man right here, R.L. Dabney. Now, this is not a Duck Dynasty character here. This actually, uh, <laughs> quite a beard there. Uh, Dabney, you probably, he was a preacher, a theologian, poet, essayist. But he, mo more importantly, or, or uh, most famous, for, he was a staff officer for uh, General Stonewall Jackson. And uh, he wrote a book called On Secular Education. And he begins it, he begins his book with this question, who should control education? And what is a proper education? And he said that the answer to, it's a two part question, but he said, how you answer the first part determines the second part. Does that make sense? I think that's a question that we don't ask enough today. The one of the very first questions we should ask in education is who should control education? That is a critical question. Should it be parents? Should it be families? What involvement should the church have? Does the church have responsibility? Does the church have a mandate in, in any area in, the, in education? I believe they do. Uh, what Responsibility does the, the um, business sector or voluntary associations, which we have over a million of them in, in our country. 
what responsibility do they have in education or authority? And then what authority, if any, does civil government have in the area of education? It's a very, very good question. I actually answered that in my book, <laughs> uh, The Biblical Case for Limited Government. And one of the areas that I apply this principle to of limited government or self-government uh, is education. And another area is the area of welfare because that's a pretty important issue right now in our, in our country. Whose responsibility? Who should be con in control of welfare? We had time. We could do the same history because we have the same Christian history of welfare in our country. Marvin Olasky has documented that in his book, uh, The Tragedy of American Compassion. It's like if you're interested in that subject at all, welfare and how to reform welfare and who's responsible for, for welfare, Marvin Olasky. It's a great book. So anyway, um, back to Dabney. He made this assertion. If secular education is to ma be made consistently and honestly non-Christian, okay, so he noticed that we're changing, we've changed now from biblical education and we're doing secular education. That's one term for it. He says, if it's to be made consistently and honestly non-Christian, then they must submit to a mutilation and falsification far worse than absolute omission. It is hard to conceive how a teacher is to keep his covenant faithfully with the state so as to teach history, cosmogony, psychology, ethics, the law of nations, as to insinuate nothing favorable or unfavorable touching the preferred beliefs of either evangelical Christians, papists, Socinians, deists, pantheists, materialists, or fetish worshipers who claim equal rights. End quote. In other words, Dabney was making the point that I made, just made, you can't teach these subjects here and more, history, psychology, ethics, without a worldview. It's impossible. He saw, he and others like him saw the, the absurdity of trying to say, we're going to take the Bible, we're going to take Christianity away from education, we're, we're going to teach just generic education, okay? It's, gonna, it's not going to be Christian. It's not going to be non-Christian. It's just going to be some, some neutral type of thing. He's saying you can't do that. It's impossible. Dabney said this. this is the last quote I'll give you from Dabney. If the state in America becomes the educator, and it was in transition there, so it wasn't sure you know, how, it was, how the, what, what was going to win out. Education must be secularized totally. We have seen that their complete secularization is logically inevitable. Christians must, must prepare themselves for the following results. All prayers, catechisms, and Bibles will ultimately be driven out of the schools. Now, I think that was quite prophetic, but you've got to realize in the time that he was writing, they had the Bible there. They had prayers. They had catechisms. Everybody did it, okay? But he's saying... If the state becomes the educator, this is what's going to happen. Okay, so, which brings us to this man, Karl Marx. You think, what does he have to do with American education? <laughs> well, um, we'll see. Ideas, often ideas... Uh, they move around, <laughs> and a lot, of our, a lot of our ideas, for good or for bad, came from Europe, okay? So Marx is in Europe. In 1848, of course, with Frederick Engels, he published the Communist Manifesto. You ever read that book? It's really, it's a few, it's not long. Uh, you could pick it up and, and pull out just the pieces that, you know, would be very germane in a, in a short period of time. But I'll, I'll point out a couple things to you here. That for sure, you should look at those ten planks of the Communist Manifesto because they're they're they you know it'll scare you how much they've they've come true in our time. But he said communism may be summed up in the single sentence: abolition of private property. 
Now, Carol talked to you, one of the things that she talked to you about this morning was private property. We know that's one of the seven principles of the principle approach, right? So when someone says abolition of private property, in my training, in my understanding of scripture, I'm saying that is blatantly anti-God. That is in your face. We're going to do it exactly the opposite of what, we, you know, what God says. And then secondly, coupled with that was abolition of the family. Do you know Mark said that? Abolition of the family. Now, um, I don't know how much you know about Marx, but I don't have the time to go into it here, but a lot of times I like to look at the philosophy. I love to read biographies, you know. I really like to read good guys, but sometimes I'm forced to read bad guys like this. But um, Marx was... You know, if you want to, what I was going to say, if you want to understand somebody's philosophy, you, you kind of look at the, at, at the person that it came from, you know, Christianity. We've got Jesus, uh, you know, and his example and his model of character and so forth. Marx was a, he was a despicable guy. He was, he, he was not a good guy in his personal life, in his family life. Um, I mean, that alone doesn't tell you to reject everything that he said, but it, it's a pretty, it's, uh, if you look at his life and his character, it, it's, it's, it's not good. Um, Richard Wormbrand wrote, um, he, he was the, the voice of the martyrs. He was uh, um, tortured for, I think, I think uh, 14 years. And um, he wrote a book. He, he researched, he said there's got to be something behind Marx. It just, this just looks too diabolical, this, this philosophy that he's put forth, that, which has become a worldview. It's not just a philosophy, it's a worldview. Um, so he researched, he wrote his findings in a book called Marx and Satan and documents very clearly that, that Marx originally was a lover of God, but he turned to a God-hater in in. That all I got to do is read his writings. He wrote poetry, and um, it's it's pretty um, it's pretty clear uh, where he was in terms of uh, total rejection of God in his ways. So Marx came up with this plan to destroy the bourgeois family. And this bourgeois family. This was the ruling class. This was the capitalists. This was the you know set I'm setting one up against the other. Um, Today we call them the, the one percenters. Uh, and this, this, these, these are four of the ten planks, and then after this we'll, we'll, we'll take a break. Um, abolition of property and land. A heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Abolition of right of inheritance. And number ten is the free education for all children in public schools. Okay, so this is back in the 1800s, right? This is, this is the plan to destroy, to get rid of private property and to destroy the family and to bring communism in and to, no, that sounds bad. As, uh, to, eventually, the end of it is it's going to be a utopia, right? It's never presented as something bad. This is something good. This is something wonderful. So, what's happened? Uh, abolition of prop property and land. This is in the U.S. I'm not talking about other places. Land is taxed. didn't used to be. Our, our founders stood against taxation of land. Land owned by government. Uh, heavy progressive or graduate income tax. The, the uh, progressive income tax established with the 16th Amendment. Um, we have inheritance taxes. And then finally we have... 90% of children in government schools, and we have compulsory education laws. So without looking at the other six planks, we've, I could say, you know, we've pretty much, uh, we're pretty much there in terms of a number of the planks of the Communist Manifesto, especially the ones to get rid of private property and to destroy the family. And I started thinking about this land uh, ownership by the government, and I was perusing the internet, and I came across a visual that I had no idea that the, I guess on the screen, on my screen it's red, but on this screen it's like orange, the state within the state, 
that's how much federal land is, is, is within each one of those states. Isn't that amazing? How much federal? That's not counting state or local. That's how much federal land is owned by the government. And as far as I can tell, in my reading of the scriptures, there's no, there's no uh, um, admonition, or there's no command, or there's no right for government ownership of land. When the ch- when the children of Israel went into the promised land, God divided the land up, the entire land by the number of families, and gave every family a portion of land, and 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 by the jubilee laws made it so that it would stay in the family perpetually there was no go there was no government ownership of land so anyway i just i thought that was a kind of amazing all right so good now why did my reflection time so public re- public replaced private what was the most significant replacement and we'll i'm giving you a little um hint there this is part of the, this is in uh, Webster's definition of education. So what was, in this sad story, we're not quite through with it because we've got John Dewey to talk about. We've got to get to John Dewey. Um, but what was the most significant replacement when the public replaced the private? If you didn't hear that, she said the responsibility went from the parents to the state. Yes, exactly. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah. Education to glorify the state rather than glorify God. Yes, the whole purpose of education originally being to you had to be able to read and write so you can read the scriptures. Now things have totally changed. Scriptures are starting to be, at least this point of history that we're in, starting to be pushed out. They're still there, but now they're starting to be downplayed. Yes. Yeah, why do we go to school? Go to school so we can get into a good college. Why don't we get into a good college so we'll be able to get a good job? Why don't we get a good job so we can have the good life? You know, live the American dream, right? Is 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 that a biblical view of <laughs> of this whole thing? <laughs> but you hear that all the time. I I heard it as a guidance counselor working with students all the time, asking them why they wanted to go to college and what college they wanted to go to. I would hear some often, most often, I would hear some version of that. So, yes, even our Christian students, this is a mentality that we have that's in our culture. All right, well, we are, Grant, will you have a 15-minute break now? Okay, 15-minute break, so I'll see you back at 2.15.